Was it possible in a society seemingly so dominated by men and violence for a woman to have played a role in combat? It's certainly a heated debate and one that recent archaeological discoveries have only intensified. Today, we're talking about Viking shield maidens and whether or not they existed in history. Were they real or simply characters from legend? We know that the female Viking warrior archetype has become widely popular in cinema and media, with shows like the History Channel's Vikings, Netflix's The Last Kingdom, and now rumored female warriors in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But we also know popular culture isn't always known for its historical accuracy. So what's the evidence for and against female Viking warriors? Luckily, archaeology, archives, and museum collections provide us with evidence to explore. Let's start by looking at the Viking sagas. Women wielding weapons was not uncommon in Viking sagas, which included everything from Valkyries, shield maidens, and ordinary women forced by circumstances to take up arms and fight. According to Dr. Crawford, who has an excellent video I'll link below, women in the sagas who take up arms are often high status women with important roles in the sagas. In the sagas, a woman's role as a warrior is looked at approvingly, in some cases even receiving the highest compliments. But in the past, scholars assumed that these female warriors in literature were merely imaginative depictions. Is it possible they may have real counterparts in history? To uncover more, we have to turn to material culture and archaeology. In September of 2017, an article in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology entitled A Female Viking Warrior Confirmed by Genomics set the academic world on fire. Debate over the article spilled out into popular culture, with comment sections on popular news sites and YouTube videos filled with debate. The article explored Grave BJ581, originally excavated in 1878 by antiquarian Halmar Stolpe in Birka, Sweden. Of the more than 3,000 graves in the region, over 1,000 were excavated by Stolpe and his team. Grave BJ581 was of particular interest to Stolpe, even at the time. A chamber grave with walls, roof, and a floor, it contained the remains of one individual and an elaborate array of grave goods, including a variety of weapons, shields, a strategy game similar to modern day chess, a full set of pieces propped in the individual's lap, and two horses bridled for riding. Stolpo remarked in his report to the Royal Academy that it was, quote, perhaps one of the most remarkable of all the graves in this field. Stolpa, Using the conventions of the time, that graves with weapons were male and graves with jewelry and textile goods were female, typed the sex of the individual as being male. Due to the location of the grave on a prominent overlook, situated in a high status area of the burial grounds, its relation to the garrison building, and the contents of the grave, researchers concluded for over 100 years that the grave was that of a high status male warrior. It wasn't until much later that scientists began questioning whether or not that assessment was correct. The first hint that something was off of BJ581 was in the 1970s, when an osteological review of the remains identified the bones as belonging to a female. However, the burial goods and their prominent martial nature were not analyzed in context with the bones, and so the assessment that the bones belonged to a female failed to make any waves. That happened later, when the bones from the grave were reevaluated in a study on Viking health, published in 2014 by Anna Kellström, a Stockholm University osteologist, who noticed that the pelvic and mandibular indicators typed the skeleton as belonging to a woman. Following the osteology assessment, interest in an already unique and noteworthy grave was reignited. A group of scientists decided to seek out a final word on whether or not the individual was truly a female. Samples were taken from several of the remaining bones in the grave, and both DNA and strontium isotope analysis tests were performed. DNA analysis revealed that the occupant of BJ581 was indeed female, possessing two X chromosomes and no Y, confirming the prior osteological analysis. The test further revealed that the individual was not local to the Birka region of Scandinavia, but rather from further south. She would have been tall in comparison to her contemporaries at 5'5", and she was in her 30s when she died. Strontium isotope analysis painted a picture of an individual who moved frequently in her younger years. The scientists also brought in the leading Berka textile specialist to review the grave goods, who used comparative data to conclude that the clothing in the grave belonged to a cavalry commander. A silver tasseled cap in particular was unique, similar to those found in modern day Ukraine. This area was a route known to the Vikings, and Birka's historic role as an economic center and trading post would have likely made itinerant traders and warriors a common sight. But what made the archaeologists believe the grave belonged to a high-status warrior? For one, as a trading center, Birka would have been a vital and well-protected economic hub. 
Archaeologists have located a garrison building in town, believed to have been burned down during the conflict. Its architecture was noteworthy, as the building had over 300 knives incorporated into the walls and floor, in addition to numerous weapons like spears, swords, axes, as well as shields scattered around the building, in addition to chainmail and lamellar armor. Known martial elements are seen throughout the archaeological makeup of Birka, and they add context to the grave of BJ581, which is located not far from the garrison building. In addition to the location, the funerary goods also provide context. Out of more than 1,000 graves excavated in Birka, less than 75 had any weapons in the grave at all, and far fewer had more than one weapon. BJ581 was unique in both the type and number of weapons, which included a sword, axe, spear, armor-piercing arrows, and a battle knife. The horses would have been valuable, and their placement in the grave denotes an individual of high status and wealth. The strategy game included a board and all the pieces, leading some to conclude that the individual who held them was a possible strategist or military commander. But a female warrior in the grave remains controversial, and alternative theories have been proposed. Some have claimed that a male was intended to have been placed in the grave, in addition to or instead of the female. Archaeologists have argued that this is unlikely, given that the grave appears to be prepared to only hold one person due to the size and arrangement of the grave goods. Double burials in chamber graves are uncommon in Birka, with less than a dozen examples out of the 1,000. Stolpa does not draw or mention any additional bones. And in an 1879 report, he writes that the grave contained a single body. We also see no evidence of what would be perceived as female-associated grave goods, like textiles or jewelry. Another theory was that the bones had been misidentified, as they left the site to be put in storage, or were jumbled in storage sometime over the last 150 years. While there is some reason to see this as a more plausible theory than the double grave, as the cranium of the individual is missing and an extraneous femur was found in the box, it still seems unlikely. Stolpa was known for keeping copious notes and drawings, even exceeding expectations of the day, with his use of graph paper and more scientific methods known to be used more by archaeologists than antiquarians. His drawings and notes are still available to this day online, which I'll link below if you'd like to see them. The drawings of the bones and Stolpa's notes point to BJ581 as the most likely match, due to the spinal column and the unique state of preservation. While they did find an extra femur stored with the remains of BJ581, all the BJ581 bones were accurately marked and the extraneous femur was clearly marked BJ584, clearing up any confusion. The missing cranium is also not uncommon amongst the Birka remains, where many of the craniums have been removed from their original context. While BJ581's cranium has not yet been found, archaeologists posit that this was likely moved to an anatomical collection and will likely be found someday in the future. Detractors of the study claim that the lack of combat damage on the skeletal remains proves that the individual was not a warrior, but only portions of the individual skeleton remain. The cranium, ribs, parts of the pelvis, and the shoulder bones are missing. Again, I'll post the link below to some of the supplemental materials where you can review the additional photos and drawings for yourself. We also know that with a mounted archer, we tend to see less brutal combat damage than what we might with hand-to-hand -hand combatants, and the damage we do see tends to look different. But despite this evidence, notable scholars in the field of Viking studies still disagree about the findings. There is no consensus on the analysis, but of course, this isn't unheard of in archaeology. However, Birka is no longer the only proposed female Viking warrior grave. Two Norwegian graves, grave CC22541 dubbed Erica the Red by National Geographic, who used modeling to reconstruct her battle-damaged face, and another unmarked burial in Norway give us two more potential examples of female Viking warriors. Erica the Red, estimated to be from the mid-900s, was buried with a double-edged sword, an axe, shield, arrowheads, and again, a bridled horse at the foot of her grave. She's believed to be a female between 18 and 19 years of age, and scientists are planning to do DNA analysis on her grave, although as of this video going live, do not appear to have published their findings yet. The second grave was a 20-year-old female, buried in a bed of textiles and feathers with a scabbard, damascene sword, a sickle, gaming pieces, chess, and a dog. Much like the grave in Berka, the women are surrounded in death by weapons previously believed to only be wielded by male warriors. The Scandinavian archaeological record also appears to have clues about female Viking warriors. A 3D figurine from Harvey in Denmark held at the National Museum of Denmark depicts females on horseback and standing nearby bearing shields, swords, and lances. A second figurine, made of silver from a manor at Tissot, also held by the National Museum of Denmark, shows a woman on horseback, ready to fight, and a figure with a voluminous dress holding a shield nearby, also believed to be depicting a woman. 
The famous Osberg burial contained two women, and the Osberg tapestry, which was included, depicts women that appear in a warlike setting prepared to enter combat. We also have historical texts, like John Skylitz's compilation of imperial military campaigns that point to the potential for female warriors. In his account of the Byzantine and Rus' War in 871, he notes that when the Byzantines looted the corpses on the battlefield, they found the bodies of women, equipped like men, presumed to have been fighting together. In The War of the Irish with the Foreigners, a 12th century text, a list of raiding flotillas and their commanders included a red girl, or red daughter. The Annals of Clon McNoys, a 17th century translation of the medieval original, also references a red daughter commander. The Annals of Ulster references female Viking warrior military commanders, one called the Maid in an 881 battle against the Irish and another Maid in 1098 battle against the foreigners. The Annals of Innisfallen describe a plundering force in 905 made up of close-cropped women. And Abo's eyewitness account of the Vikings in Paris in late 8085 notes that Viking women were present on the ships and were physically close to the fighting. There seems to be mounting evidence for the reality of female combatants, but challenges to the science and historiography continue. An important part of the debate continues to be our need to remember our current biases, the historical biases of Stolpa and his contemporaries, as well as our lens of interpretation. Remembering these biases as we try to analyze and reconstruct Viking society through primary resources left to us is invaluable. More DNA tests and re-evaluations of Viking graves with warrior goods are sure to happen, and will keep us debating as more data reveals the contours of the Viking world. If you like this video, please subscribe, and feel free to let me know in the comments below what you'd like to see more of in the future.